Uh, good morning, everybody. On behalf of the GEO Institute Soil Improvement Technical Committee, we welcome you to the 2018 Soil Improvement uh, Web Conference. Um, I want to say a word of uh, uh, thank you here to um, uh, Keller, who is our gold sponsor. And I'm pushing the next slide and it's taking a little time. Okay, there we go. So we want to say a word of thanks to Keller, who is our gold, uh, gold sponsor. The connected companies of Keller in North America are uniquely positioned to handle the most complex geotechnical construction projects nationwide and uh, also uh, internationally, I know that. And uh, by including all services in one contract, we reduce client risk and ensure that all aspects of a project are met on time and on budget. So once again, uh, thank you, Keller, for being uh, the gold sponsor for this uh, event. Uh, the next uh, slide here shows the program for today. Uh, we have six presentations. They're shown here in the sequence in which they'll be uh, presented. And for each one of the presentations, I'll make a very brief introduction of the speaker. And uh, each speaker will have about 18 minutes and then four to five minutes for questions and answers. So our first speaker of the day is Dr. Vernon Schaefer. He's the James M. Hoover Professor of Geotechnical Engineering in the College of Engineering at Iowa State University. And he'll talk to us about the geotech tools. Dr. Schaefer. Thank you, Jose. Um, I'm going to talk to you about geotech tools, a, a web-based system. It's the first place to look for a solution for ground improvement and geoconstruction techniques. What this is is a website. The web address is shown here, www.geotechtools.org. It's a website for geoconstruction information, technology selection and guidance for project planning and development, program delivery, improved uh, infrastructure performance. So to, I'm going to start this off by having you think about a few questions. How do you keep up on geotechnologies? Where do you get your information on the, the fast-changing array of, of ground improvement techniques that we have. How do you select one technology over another or, or others when you get a, a short list? How do you know if your consultant or contractor is selecting an appropriate technology for your site conditions? The Geotech Tools is a comprehensive web-based information and guidance system for embankment, ground improvement, and pavement applications. I'll show you the, the details as we go through this today. This was developed by uh, the Sharp II program, um, which, you know, had input from Federal Highway Administration, AASHTO, and TRB. So I want to acknowledge our the sponsors of the development of this program. What is Geotech Tools? Well, it's a, a web-based system that has a huge toolbox in it. There's more than 50 geoconstruction technologies contained in, in this website. There are case histories, photographs, technology fact sheets, QA, QC procedures, design procedures, guide specifications, cost estimating tools, and a technical bibliography for each of these technologies. Presentation today, I'm going to give you a bit of background on Geotech Tools, its development and future uh, in its future. Um, I won't do a, a live demonstration, but we will see some screenshots of the system. And I will invite you to, to join the system and, and play around with it. The project vision for the development of this website was to make geotechnical solutions more accessible to public agencies in the U.S. for the purpose of rapid renewal and improvement of the transportation infrastructure. Now, having developed it for transportation infrastructure, it also has great applicability to other types of things, building construction and, and other types of things. The SHARP-2 renewal objectives were to do rapid renewal of transportation facilities. You know, that's the old adage of, of uh, get in, get out, and stay out. Do, do this uh, renewal with minimal disruption of traffic and then produce long-lived facilities. In 
doing this, our project had three elements to it. So it doesn't cover everything in geotechnical engineering, but it covers construction of new embankments and roadways over areas of unstable soils, widening and expansion of existing embankments and roadways, and then improvement and stabilization of the support beneath the pavement structure. Now, in the next four slides, I'm going to show you some cartoons of these elements that we use to depict these. The first one is construction over unstable soils, and so we're working in the area beneath an embankment or beneath a retaining wall. And these are solutions to, uh, if we have unstable soils, uh, problem soils, that we can improve these soils so that we can build on them. The second one is in construction over stable or stabilized soil. So we have an embankment, we have a retaining structure, you know, we have a, a landslide stabilization technique using perhaps ground anchors or soil nails, those kinds of technologies. The next two deal with uh, the, the third element, which was kind of the pavement subgrade and base and subbase. And we've got two elements here. Uh, this one is the geotechnical pavement component. So this is looking at subgrade soils, subbase, and base. These are permanent applications. And then the next slide shows much the same thing, but if we have unstable soils, but we need a working platform solution or maybe a haul road. And so we divided this up into two, a permanent application and then temporary application. So the working platforms are considered a, a temporary application. The next three slides will show all of the technologies addressed in the system. Now there's 48 of them listed here. I'm not gonna go over them each of them in, in any kind of detail, but you can see a lot of, of well-known types of technologies, chemical stabilization of subgrade, uh, continuous flight auger piles, deep dynamic compaction, column-supported embankments, and then a few new ones perhaps, biotreatment for subgrade, stable, <clears throat> stabilization. On the next slide, we see a continuing list. Um, on this one, you see a lot of geosynthetic uh, systems. There are 16 different geosynthetic systems within the uh, within geotech tools. Here we see excavation and replacement highlighted in red. That's because this is a base technology against which we'll compare lots of other technologies. We have one other base technology on the next slide, uh, and that is traditional compaction. You know, every state has their own specifications for. Uh, traditional compaction. And here we see some things like uh, jet grouting, lightweight fills, reinforced soil slopes, some soil nailing aspects, uh, PVDs and fill preloading, MSC walls. Highlighted in blue is mass mixing methods. Now, this, the system went live in November of 2012, and mass mixing was added a couple of years later uh, through an oversight. We didn't have it in the original system. And so we added it. It shows the living nature of the system that we have in terms of we can add technologies. So we have a, a template for each of the products that we have that we can easily put in new technologies. So what do we have within the system? Well, the main product is the web-based information and guidance system. Okay, Within that system, then we have what we call products for each of these. For each technology, there are technology fact sheets, which are two-page uh, summaries of the technologies. There are photographs that show what the technology is. There's a compilation of the design procedures to use for that technology. And there's, similarly, there's a compilation of the quality control and quality assurance procedures to use for that technology. There's a cost estimating tool. Uh, in particular, there's two parts to this cost estimating tool. One is a, a narrative that describes what are the key items that go into estimating this particular technology. What are the materials? What is the equipment usage used? That kind of thing. And then for about for 42 of the technologies, there's an uh, Excel spreadsheet that we developed that's not copy protected, but that can be used to develop a project-specific cost estimate on a preliminary basis. And then we have guide specifications for, for most of the technologies. There's a few that we don't. For instance, the biostabilization, we don't have a guide spec for that yet. And there's a bibliography um, that, that has a lot of information if you want more information. And then for each of these, we have case histories. At the present time, most of the case histories are transportation-based. Okay. 
Who is the audience for this? Well, it was developed for public agency personnel at local, state, and federal levels, primarily geotechnical engineers. But we also have, you know, we have a number of uh, civil or bridge, bridge engineers in it, project managers, uh, district engineers, that kind of thing. And, you know, what we found out, there's a lot of consultants, general contractors, and architects, engineer uh, companies that have awful, also joined this. Well, think about that. The, the Most of the work being done for state DOTs these days is done by a lot of consultants, so, <clears throat> you know, they're a, a large user of it. And then we have a large number of academics and students on it. The next slide shows some of the... Uh, the, the audience's status. As I mentioned, it was launched in November of 2012. We presently have over 8,000 registered users. Of the, that number, uh, 5,400 are geotechnical engineers, 540 pavement engineers, 920 structural engineers, um, 1,880 public, which is primarily DOT, uh, local um, or county engineers, and FHWA people. 3,280 consultants and 1,800 academic users. A lot of students and about 350 faculty. Some of my colleagues use this uh, website for their ground improvement classes. We have registered users from all 50 states, all Canadian provinces, and users from over 100 countries have, have signed on to use Geotech tools. So how do you use Geotech tools? Well, the website can be used to learn about technologies, both Technical and non-technical users can benefit from it. So say you've got somebody on a, a, a local board, a county board, and they want to, you know, they're going to uh, use a certain technology. The, the two-page uh, technology fact sheet can be taken to a public meeting, and they can show the, the people what they're going to be um, using for a technology. So it's, it's kind of very informational that way. You can investigate candidate solutions by either a category classification or the selection system. We can locate design methods to use the quality control methods, develop cost estimates, specifications, and technical summaries. And again, then we've got these additional references. What is the value of this system? Well, what we've done here is developed a web-based system that collects synthesizes, integrates, organizes a vast amount of critically important information about a large number of geotechnical solutions, and it's readily available on this website. Um, you just, you know, e we'll see it's easy to, to join it. So what we did in our process was we had 40 postdoc and graduate students organize the, took a, and reviewed a lot of information, thousands of pages of technical documents, they put this in, and, and we had then 12 principal investigators. We had an advisory board. We had peer reviewers. These developed uh, what we called comprehensive technical summaries of, of the technologies, and then these resulted in then the, the tools or the products that we have, which are one to 40 pages um, each um, in that. And so that's how we, we, we vetted all of these. The objective of the system identify potential technologies for the four applications. Because some of the technologies have many pieces to it, um, <clears throat> take lightweight fill, there's half a dozen different types of lightweight fill. We've got more than 50 technologies. There's um, up-to-date information on in the eight products and tools for each technology. We have guidance to develop a short list of applicable technologies, and then guidance for project-specific screening and then we provided all this in an interactive program system. What's the future hold? I'm going to go over this a, a bit just before we, we take a look at some slide um, screenshots. <clears throat> you know, the system's about five years old, <clears throat> and there were some, you know, it, it was developed by some engineers. We've now engaged a, a web design company, and we're going to come out with a new platform later this year. There's updates to some of the technical information, but key among this is that there's a dynamic dimensioning that will take place. So it's as easy to use on a cell phone or a tablet as it is on a, a desktop. We've in, incorporated search capability. You can put in a keyword and, and search for that. There's uh, some reordering of the technologies that you can do interactively. You can do that kind of thing. And then we're working with the Geo Institute um, to, for them to become the future host of the system. We expect that this will lead to uh, expansion.
expansion of the elements, building foundations, location for geotech, databases, and, and the like. I'm going to show you some slides. Now, this is the login slide. If you're not registered, you just click on that, and you can fill out the information, and in about 10 seconds, you'll be on the system. This is the opening page. We've got uh, a catalog of technologies and the technology selection there. We'll talk about that. There's always uh, on the left side, you can always go over to the hot links there. Here's the catalog of technologies. They're in alphabetical order, and clicking on these uh, takes you to the technology page for that particular technology. The selection system is the heart and soul of the system. Two ways we can view technologies by classification or using the interactive selection system. So we'll take a look at that. And what you see here, the technologies are always on the right side, all 48 of them. And we have 11 different groupings of technologies by classification, say, for earthwork construction, soft ground uh, design and construction, densification, and then there's uh, several others. Uh, you know, the slide goes on, so it's hard, uh, screen, so it's hard to see it on a, a slide. And then the technologies selection system, if we click the access, the interactive selection system, we have these 48 technologies on the right side. Our cartoons that we saw earlier show up, and we click on one of these, and if we look at construction over unstable soils, we're going to go from 48 technologies there now to a list of 26 technologies. We've knocked out uh, 22 of them that don't apply here. And now we, we now make some other selections. And the first one being in uh, soils engineers, we're going to select the unsuitable soil condition. If we pick wet and weak fine-grained soils, we now see some technologies grayed out. Blast densification, well, that's not going to work very well in a saturated clay. Then we pick the depth of the soil. And if I pick, I pick the 30 to 50 feet, some additional ones fall out. So this becomes the screening process. Now, with this particular part, we found that we needed to provide some spe project-specific technology selection. So there's a list of 12 questions that you can further answer to narrow this list down. So right now, there'd be 12 technologies, and we like to get the list to about three to five so that people can then use their engineering judgment and their engineering uh, sense of things to, to select things. So that's kind of the, the selection system. Um, please go visit Geotech Tools if, if you haven't already. Sign up and, and just play with it. And there's a place to comment on there. Um, we're always asking for questions. It's, it's the profession's website, and we're asking you to contribute to it, to maintain it, and keep it up to date. So with that, I'll uh, go to the Q&A and see if there's any questions. Okay. Um... I don't see any specific questions here addressed to you, Vern. Uh, one, uh, one question that I have myself here is uh, on the technology selection. I guess the, uh, the, the, the selection is uh, solely on uh, technical merits, right? I mean, that's a technical uh, selection. Yeah, it's, it's based on whether it will be technically feasible to use that technology for the given soil conditions, the given project conditions that one is input. And then at the end of that, you know, we, we want three to five technologies to fall out. And then, you know, using the um, cost estimating um, spreadsheets, one can then develop a, a comparison of what would be the cost estimate to use that. Now, to develop a cost estimate, you'd probably have to do a little bit of design, you know, if, we, if we're doing something that, you know, has some columns in it, we'd have to, what's going to be the spacing of our columns and the size of those, you know, if we, various things. So you have to do a little bit of design work and then do a cost estimate, and then that gives you a comparison um, of what you can do based on technical feasibility and then, you know, the cost. And maybe there's some other things, you know, um, is, is the equipment even available in a particular state? Sometimes, you know, some of the specialized equipment's not low not within 500 miles of a particular site. So those are the things that you then have to, to think about once, once you've looked at it. But our system is going on technical feasibility. Okay. Uh, 
one another question that came here is uh, through the uh, uh, one of the uh, attendees is how can one contribute to the system? Okay. Um, if you go onto the system onto the left side, I, I don't think I can. I don't know if I can back up. Um, let me see if I can. I can back up a little bit. Okay. Right over here, uh, so I've gone to project specific selection. On the right, on the left hand side, there's a column of hot links and there's a submit a comment, there's a submit technology specific information. So either of those two links will allow you to make a comment on a technology or submit information for a specific technology. Okay. That was the only question I could see here, so. Uh, okay. Thank you, Vern, very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so our next uh, presentation is going to be by Mr. Chris Woods. He's a vice president at the Dentification, Inc. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, Thank Always you, a tough act to uh, have to follow Dr. Schaefer there, but I'll I'll do my best here. Um, I am going to talk today, uh, give a case study, uh, the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey, where the New Jersey Devils play hockey. Uh, I'm going to go through a, a case history that talks about the implementation of a ground improvement program in a heavily urban area. Uh, that was able to save, you know, millions of dollars on a structure this size by, you know, avoiding a pile foundation system. So let's just get into it here. So we're going to go through about five parts. I'm going to talk briefly about, you know, the investigation, some of the site history, you know, important features, give some details on a dynamic compaction test section that was performed, then move into the overall site prep, talk about the overall ground improvement uh, program, and then just a couple quick uh, photos of the uh, foundation construction. All right, so here is an aerial that's loading. This is an aerial of the site. A couple important features to note along the top of the page. You see several buildings up here. Uh, along the left side of, of the photo, you could see other uh, structures that were to remain uh, up here, you have a church that was built in the mid-1600s, uh, the oldest church in New Jersey. You can also see other, you know, buildings along the right side of the site here, and then just note the fact that it's bound on four sides by city streets, all of which contain utilities beneath them. So some of the uh, key history pieces to the site. Part of the site was a former cemetery potter field for a couple hundred years back in the 1700s to 1900s. The southern portion of the site, rail yards, uh, rail structures through there. And then as you can see in the aerial um, from the 1900s till you know the development of the arena, several mixed use retail commercial um, structures on the site. So here we have a, uh, a Sanborn map. Uh, this is rotated 90 degrees to the right. So um, the church I had pointed to is, was over here. You can see the area on the site where the cemetery used to exist. You can also, on this map, see the rail lines coming in and out of site, along with all the buildings around the perimeter. So there was multiple investigations that went on in this site, and you know, a typical urban fill for 15 feet at the surface, and then the, the remaining Geologic features were, you know, a glacial outwash, glacial till, shale bedrock, uh, fairly typical of, of that area of North Jersey. Groundwater was about, you know, 20 feet deep or so. So really the, the bad actor that needed to be addressed in terms of foundation support was the, uh, the uncontrolled fill at the surface. And then you can see this range of the outwash sands, you know, some blow counts as low as seven, you know, blows a foot. That was you know, predominantly at the upper piece of the of the the sand, so really you had about 15 to you know 20 feet of, of materials that needed to be addressed. A 
aside from the borings that were conducted, you had test pits that were done given the significant development that had been done at the site before. And in these test pits, you had large obstructions, concrete, you know, elements, foundations associated with the former rail uh, usage on site. But you also had several hundred sets of human remains that were also left in the site that were theoretically disinterred, but that had obviously not been the case. So um, maybe a little different than a typical geotechnical investigation where you're just worried about what the you know, foundation remnants may be. Uh, we also had human remains and gravestones to deal with. So this is just, you know, the, it's really for the color. It's just to sort of show the magnitude, order of magnitude, this darker material up at the surface is the fill. This lighter material is the sand, and then you get down into the glacial till and the bedrock, which was, you know, 40 to 50 feet down. So based on the, you know, on the uh, various investigations, what, what do we have here? We've got the uncontrolled fill. We've got, for an arena such as this, you don't have intermediate columns. So you've got very high column loads associated with the long spans. You have subsurface obstructions. You've got archaeological components. And you've got historical structures and util utilities adjacent to the site, basically on all sides, that had to be addressed in, in devising a, a foundation solution here. So ultimately, what was come up with, the, the program that was come up with was a hybrid, right? A lot of the site, the fill was very receptive in a vacuum to improvement by dynamic compaction. Anyone that's been involved with a dynamic compaction project knows that there are vibration-related issues there, which that would then be at odds with the historical structures and utilities. So you also have the buildings that were around the perimeter of the site, that needed to be demolished and removed, most of which had basements. So the plan was to essentially use those buildings around the perimeter as a removal and replacement option because you're essentially removing all the fill down to the sand. And then in the center of the site for, you know, three to 400,000 feet of the site, implement the dynamic impaction program and take advantage of the, the economy, um, you know, from that that technique compared to just digging out 20 feet of the entire site. In, an, in, in analyzing, you know, the system that was going to be put in place versus a pile foundation, there was a lot of uh, back and forth with the structural engineer. How much settlement could the, the building take with these kind of spans? And you know, ultimately, the maximum settlement was two inches that, that could be handled. Differential settlements of three quarters of an inch were targeted. And so using, a, you know, several different methods of, of settlement analysis, uh, we concluded that based on the conditions encountered, assuming that they were going to be improved to a certain level, we'd be able to very clearly implement a ground improvement program versus putting the structure on piles. All right. So one of the issues that did come up during the design phase was the fact that the initial intent was to design the foundation system with a 2 TSF bearing pressure. And the structural engineer came back and said, well, 3 TSF would be a lot better. So for a project of this size, we said, why don't we do a test section? So we mobilized the dynamic compaction crane. We picked a 50 by 50 area. And the idea was to, um, you know, do some before and after testing to assess whether or not we could get to the 3 TSF that they wanted which would, you know, then allow a redesign of the foundation while the program went on. And then as a secondary benefit was to collect vibration-related data uh, so we knew what the effects of adja on its adjacent structures and utilities would be and how we could address those during construction. Right. So a couple of things that were looked at from vibration control, we installed an isolation trench along one side of the test section. We put in a sheet pile wall on another side and did vibration monitor on both sides to see what the level of mitigation was with each of those measures. Some borings and CPTs were performed both before and after the improvement phase. And the idea was that a three-pass system was implemented, you know, two offsetting grids on a 10-foot spacing with a third foundation pass uh, to mimic what we anticipated would be the program uh, you know, during the production phase. 
So here's just a quick sketch that kind of shows, you know, what the general layout, you know, the black borings and CPT locations were before, and then we came in and did uh, very close locations after, just to compare before and after. Here we have the test section area in, in the background of the picture where the weight's dropping. You can see the seismographs here and here. So again, collecting data on either side of the sheet pile wall. We also have the isolation trench that was along the site and the adjacent street. And again, vibration data collected on either side of the trench to assess what the mitigation was. So some results. The blue represents the, the pre-improvement SPTs, and then the red shows the, the post-improvement SPTs. So we had, uh, you know, very good uh, improvement within the upper 15 to 20 feet uh, using the SPT values. And then here again, you can kind of see the shift, you know, with the blue being before and the red being after. These are the, the tip resistances on the CPT testing. So the summary here is, you know, the average didn't increase that much, right, for the end values. We went from an average of 26 to, say, 29. What was most important was that our minimums went up into a medium-dense condition and that we saw uniform conditions during the ground improvement work, during the actual dropping of the weight. And so that uniformity combined with the increase in the, in the minimum level of end values, uh, you know, let everyone to feel really good about the program that was being implemented and that we could get to that, that 3TSF that the structural engineer was looking for. And here we have just a quick slide. So what you could see is the blue lines re represent, you know, in front of the sheet pile wall and then behind the sheet pile wall, what was the mitigation levels. You can kind of see here at 100 feet, you went from about an inch and a half to, you know, a little less than an inch. But the red, you could see the before and after of the use of the isolation trench on this site. And at 100 feet, you went from, you know, an inch and three quarters, say, to, you know, less than a half inch. So the clear conclusion here was that the isolation trench was going to be the way to go in terms of mitigating vibrations off-site to the, the adjacent utilities. And here, you know, you can see about 70% reduction with the, with the trench, maybe about 35% with the issue pile wall. All right, so the summary of the test section was that, again, the three tons was achievable, the isolation trench be used, and then from that we came up with some guidelines in conjunction with, you know, the city of Newark structural engineers as to what were the vibration levels that were going to be tolerable during construction, uh, you know, an inch per second near the utilities because they were pretty old, half inch a second for most of the structures, and then a quarter inch at the um, – at the uh, old church, it was constructed in the 1600s, which that was the closest site, uh, closest building to us, which was probably about 90 feet from, from where the weight had been dropped. All right, so some of the photos of the site preparation. Here you can see, you know, some of the buildings being demolished around the perimeter, the fill being removed here in the foreground. Here we have one of the old rail foundation elements uh, that was in the ground that, that had to be taken out. And then here we see the team of archaeologists uh, that ultimately, after about a four-month period, uh, removed something on the order of 23 or 2,400 sets of, of human remains that dated back, you know, to the 16 or 1700s. Um, you know, they were properly uh, taken, uh, you know, off-site. Uh, and one of the unique findings was uh, a couple iron sarcophaguses that were later, you know, taken down to the Smithsonian and opened. And, you know, uh, just an interesting aspect that you don't see on a lot of geotechnical projects. All right. So as we got into the production phase, all right, there we go. Okay. What are the things we're looking at during production now of this program? We're looking at the crater depth. We're looking to see relative 
depth, you know, we see in three foot craters and then all of a sudden six foot craters. We want to see that uniform uh, compaction under the dropping of the weight, full time monitoring of the vibrations, and then, you know, the removal and replacement, uh, you know, like a typical earthwork job. So we had our, again, three pass system. We're using a 15 ton weight, 55 feet, uh, two offsetting 10 foot grids, and the foundation pass. Here we had a very helpful tool. This was a crater depth map that allowed us to see where the craters were deeper and shallower. And so when we did our post improvement evaluation, what areas we needed to target in terms of additional energy to get the post improvement evaluation to where we needed to be. And here we just have a couple of photos. You can see the, the church and some of the structures nearby. Here we have a nice aerial photo, and this kind of, you know, highlights the removal and replacement along one side and the dynamic compaction in the middle of the site. Another photo, you can see all the, the urban fill being taken out following the demolition of the buildings. Here you see the replacement of the fill uh, in compacted structural lifts. Okay, so pretty consistent with the um, with the test section, we saw an increase in the overall average end value from you know mid twenties to over thirty, uh, but again we saw that you know increase of of the minimum values as well, which was really you know indicating that we had really densified this material. And here, you just see a plot showing you know this was our test section data, the blue and the red. And then this light blue shows that even during the production, we even exceeded the improvement levels that we saw during the test section. All right. So a couple last photos here, just the scale of some of these foundations. Uh, and you can just, you know, see the, the, the size of uh, and the scale of foundations for an arena this large. Uh, here we have a photo, you know, all the stone and, you know, sumps in the corner to make sure we're getting water out. Uh, but again, you know, large sort of radial footings. And here's another really good aerial photo that kind of shows the radial footings going around the outside of the arena with the ice area being right there. Sorry, one more photo. We got the steel going up here in the foreground. And then here we have the uh, the finished product where they've been playing for for over ten years now. So at this point, I'll open uh, open it up and I'll flip over to the Q and A section and see what questions we have here. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, all right, a couple of so questions here. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first one is on the, the types of foundations. Uh, pretty much everything in that area was on shallow foundations. There was really nothing on on any sort of deep foundation systems. The old church that I referred to was actually a rubble foundation, and you know we had to do a whole pre-construction survey of that structure, and we were down in the basement, and it turns out there were old tunnels that were used as part of the Underground Railroad. and. It was a very, very interesting uh, structure, but that was on, on rubble, but the rest of it was on, on shallow foundations. Um, next question we got here, uh, dynamic, why was dynamic compaction selected in, instead of the other feasible technologies? Uh, in looking through a lot of them, uh, relatively speaking, compared to you know a, a field that big, that w the area where which the aggregate piers would have been used is you know, judged to be, you know, the more economical of the solutions, given the fact that we also had the ability to implement the removal and replacement around the exterior of the site. And so a lot of it had to do with, with, the, with the economics of the situation, especially compared to the alternative being just go drive piles. You know, with all those obstructions, uh, driving piles would have been, you know, pretty difficult in the first place. 
Um, and I guess sort of a similar question, you know, what other methods were considered? Uh, really, the, the three main options were, do we drive piles? Do we dig out 20 feet over the entire site? Or do we come up with this hybrid uh, solution um, that we ended up, you know, coming up with, with the dynamic compaction, the removal and replacement? Those were really the three that were given uh, serious thought, um, you know, vibro compaction, geo peers. Again, those were options that I think were, were considered to be maybe not as economical as a dynamic compaction at the time. And when you then looked at the, you know, the cost of digging out 20 feet of the entire site, you also have then the idea of it's Northern Jersey contaminated urban fill. So anything that comes out, if you can't put it back, um, you know, you then have potential of contaminated offsite fill disposal, which is another number, which, you know, frankly, when you're talking about removing that much material, that's a huge unknown as to how much you may or may not be able to put back in the ground. So, um, you know, again, you know, the dynamic compaction was an option that was chosen because it was improving that material in situ and helped mitigate that additional environmental risk of having the exposure to huge costs of offsite disposal. Okay, Chris, uh, two more questions popped up here. I don't know if you can address them or. Yeah, oh, let, me, let me refresh. There we go. How deep is the vibration mitigation depth? I mean, generally those trenches were about 10 feet deep. We were trying to get below the um, depth of the utilities in the street adjacent. Um, that's true. Okay. Um, this is, I guess, this second one's a three-part. So, uh, yeah, again, the trench is about 10 feet. Uh, what was the disturbed crater zone removed and compact? Uh, idea, you know, what was done there was the crater zone was generally the craters were on the average, you know, three to four feet deep. So what happened was the area was leveled. Uh, you know, the, the high points were pushed into the low point. The craters were dozed, and then an ironing pass was implemented, and that is a, a lower energy uh, tamping of, of the site throughout that crater zone to try and tighten up. You know, it's, it's a little more energy than, than just, say, hitting it with a roller, and you can tighten up that three- to four-foot crater zone that way. And then ultimately from a uh, the SPT, you know, we, we had conducted many different um, versions of settlement analysis, and so we were really looking not so much for a net percentage increase, but we were looking for more of a minimum in value to satisfy that, you know, the settlement calculations were done were based on, you know, a certain minimum end value, and then that would be, you know, compatible with the settlements that the structural engineer was looking for. Uh, did you address the question of how deep the vibration mitigation depth? Uh, yeah, I believe so. That, if I'm understanding it correctly, that would have been the, you know, talking about the trench, and the trench was, again, about 10 feet deep to try and get to, you know, the invert of the adjacent utilities out in the street. Okay, yeah. A uh, couple more popped up here. I think we have a few minutes here, Chris. So if you uh, want to address those three that... Uh, sure. Um, was there a concern with the settlement? Um, not really, and in the sense that, you know, we were basically compacting, you know, between the, the compaction effort of that 15 feet of fill, uh, you know, 15 to 20 feet of, of fill, with the dynamic compaction and also the, um, uh, you know, controlled fill placement, you were essentially compacting the material to the, to the same levels. And then again, with it also being a granular material, any settlements that were really going to happen here would have been, you know, relatively short-term settlements during the construction of, of the arena. So um, there really wasn't a, a concern about, you know, too much differential between the two methods. They seemed pretty compatible. Um, the main soil condition type. So going back a couple slides, it was predominantly a, you know, 15-foot thick layer of miscellaneous urban fill that was a concern. Then there was a thick layer of glacial sands beneath it, you know, with the upper, say, five to eight feet or so perhaps being in a loose condition. So we're really targeting about that upper, upper 20 feet uh, from an improvement standpoint. 
and then again, just to you know address the Stone Columns one more time, uh, not not really. Um, I mean, we're probably talked about as an option, but again, the three options that were really given the considerable um, thought were a full removal and replacement, a deep foundation system, and then this hybrid system of the dynamic compaction and the removal and replacement. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I don't think there's any more questions here, so uh, we'll move on to the okay. next uh, very good. speaker. Thank you very much. And uh, we are a few minutes ahead of schedule here, but anyway, uh, my next uh, speaker is Mr. James Hudson, and he's a director of uh, Keller Foundations. Uh, do you have control there, Jim, over the slides? Um. I thought I did, but now my presentation disappeared. Let's see. <laughs> nope. Might have to go back to the uh, people running it and see where, where the presentation went. Um, tell you what, just to keep things moving, um, let's see. They're going to try to push the slides back. Let's see. If, if it doesn't work, you might need to skip me while they get my uh, presentation back visible. I don't see it here in the slide deck. Yeah, I think Nadia is looking into it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and uh, go, if you would, please go on to the next presenter and we'll get my slide deck straightened out. All right. This is Leon. So we'll skip uh, we'll skip Jim and go to uh, Dr. Leon. Do you have your slides, uh, Leon? Or? I think they're in in line. Uh, let me check if they're on screen. Oh, don't remove them. Oh, I see they're they're coming up. The other ones are coming up now. Um, what's currently on screen? Oh, here I am. Can you hear me properly? Yeah, let me just say a brief introduction here. Dr. Leon van Passen is an associate professor in the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment at Arizona State University. So he's our next speaker. Thank you, Leon. Go ahead. Uh, all right, I'm here. So uh, this is a talk I actually gave during our tour to China with the Soil Improvement Committee. Um, so I will tell you a bit about the current state of the art on bio-based ground improvement methods. So um, first, yeah, why we need ground improvement. I think that's obvious. Everybody knows the grounds are typically not always as stable as we would like them to be. So uh, if we then look at all the traditional methods, I think, uh, well, I have to check the geotech tool sites. Uh, I think I visited only once uh, to get all the impression about what's out there. Uh, but well, here's a list of what's out there on typical methods which are currently being used uh, when we do ground stabilization. Um, however, these technologies are not always uh, applicable in every condition. So typically, uh, the traditional ground improvement methods uh, require large machinery, uh, not always accessible on site. Uh, sometimes you have to prepare the site in order to get access uh, for the large equipment. Uh, it may lead to soil instability. Uh, if there's already existing structures, you may have an issue uh, not being able to apply them, or if there's very close neighboring structures. So if you do grounding, grouting methods, you may reduce permeability of the ground, uh, which is also not always desirable. So you restrict groundwater flow. Uh, costs are significantly variable. This is just estimates I gained. Uh, I think there's a huge range depending on um, on what technology you applied. Don't don't um, fix me on this. This is just my my personal estimates. Uh, and there's a significant environmental impact, particularly when we look for uh, uh, cement consumption. Uh, the average cement consumption per person per year uh, is about 500 kilograms, uh, which is uh, more actually than we typically eat. So there's a significant impact in the construction industry. Um, 
So with that in mind, um, working at the Center for Bio-Based and Bio-Inspired Geotechnics, it's an engineering research center, which is led by Arizona State University. Uh, we, we look at how nature does it. So if we look at the natural transition from uh, loose, unconsolidated sands to sandstones, uh, that happens and you don't have to do anything. You just have to wait. Except, but yeah, you have to wait a million of years. So that's, that's typically not an engineering uh, time. So the challenge we faced here was, can we accelerate these processes within the engineering time to um, get stabilized soils? So, um, well, if we look at nature, uh, it's not always as slow, particularly if you look at biology, they can be pretty fast. So um, there's various uh, occasions in nature, various examples, which show uh, significant stabilization of grounds. For example, coral growth. Uh, it's reasonably fast. If you look in, uh, in desert areas, there's termite, mound, termite mounds. They use their saliva and, and excretions to, to stabilize and cement the ground. Um, or bacteria and algae living uh, at the surface. Uh, they are able to change the environment surrounding their, uh, uh, in their surroundings uh, to, for mineral precipitates, which may result in stabilization. And these processes are relatively fast. They take place typically in a year or 1,000 years. You can see significant uh, ground improvement. All right, uh, still one year or 10,000 or 1,000 years is not really engineering time, so we have still a challenge to solve. So with this in mind, uh, there's various groups around the world who started investigating bio-based ground improvements. Uh, one of the groups is the group of Jason De Jong in UC Davis, and they came up with this very nice uh, overview of what we can try to achieve using biomediated processes. So typically, if you have a process, uh, it, uh, what, what biology does, it just catalyzes the chemical reaction, which transforms uh, some solute compounds into some solid compounds, and the solid compounds can be used to either reduce the permeability, increase the stiffness, or reduce the compressibility, and increase the shear strength, or reduce or increase the, the dilatancy of the material, depending on what the actual objective of your, your process is. Well, what kind of products are we thinking about? Typically, what we have been looking at was biominerals, uh, but also uh, the biology, particularly if you use microbiology, um, you can result in the formation of biofilms, uh, which can uh, help to either clog the soil or um, uh, change the uh, adsorption characteristics of materials. And what we recently also have been looking at was the formation of biogenic gas. So it's nice that you know these processes, you can control these processes in the lab, but eventually if you want to make them into ground improvement methods, you have to try to scale them up and uh, bring them up to field scale up, uh, up and ensure that you can get field scale applications. So, uh, with that in mind, we look well. We search, first start screening for processes which would be suitable. So, when we look at the underground, typically uh, there's no light, and because of the pore sizes, uh, there's very limited transport for particulate matter. So, with that in mind, we we focus on what processes can be used. Well, typically, we were very quickly thinking we have to use microorganisms because those are the only size of organisms which can actually fit within the pores of the soils. Um, well, there's limited amount of oxygen, so probably some anaerobic process. Um, if we focus on biomineralization, and first we focused on biomineral uh, calcium carbonate, uh, we thought about processes generating carbonate, uh, increasing the alkalinity of the liquid. Uh, we have to use soluble substrates in order to get them into the ground. And if you want to produce calcium carbonate, you have to supply also a source of calcium. So with these requirements, uh, we looked at which processes would be feasible, and the main process which we came up with was urea hydrolysis. So what's urea hydrolysis? It's the conversion of urea, which is here on the left, uh, typically found in urine. Um, but if you mix that with calcium chloride and you pump it in the ground, and you use some enzyme called urease, uh, which is uh, predominantly present in many different microorganisms and also in some plants, so um, if we can use that enzyme to catalyze this reaction, we convert the urea into carbonate, and the carbonate will react with the remaining calcium here uh, to form calcium carbonate. And what you will have left is some ammonium chloride, which stays in the solute phase and probably you have to remove. So with this process in mind, uh, we, we start uh, thinking about what should we do next in order to scale this up. 
Um, so first we have to grow some biomass, uh, then we have to take the biomass, pump it into the ground. Oh, sorry, I have to go one back. Um, we have to grow the biomass, then we have to inject some bacteria, and we have some substrates into the ground. Uh, once we inject them in the ground, uh, we have to wait until the biochemical conversion takes place, and after that we can uh, pump and remove uh, the remaining byproducts. All right, so this is the general procedure we had in mind, uh, how to design it. Well, the design involves, um, yeah, so thinking about what flow rates do you need to use, what concentrations, what pumping time do we need to apply, and how we're actually going to inject. Are we going to inject and extract? What will be the distance between injection wells uh, or just injection and extraction through a single well? So those are all the variables. And eventually, if you want to design a procedure, you have to link those variables. Go back again. Sorry, I'm too quick. Um, you, have those link to, you have to link those variables to the output parameters, which is the required strength, stiffness, permeability, porosity, and eventually we have to come up with cost estimates. So we have been working for uh, several years now on trying to get different uh, application procedures, uh, uh, trying to link those application procedures to the desired output. Uh, we could do that using a theoretical approach. Um, but in most cases, or the most successful approach actually was um, using a practical approach, which involved doing some scale-up uh, experiments. So when I started on this process, which is already uh, quite some time ago, uh, we, we encountered um, some scientists being able to produce a small column, uh, which was about 10 centimeters, and the question I got was, make sure that we can scale this up and uh, prepare it for field-scale application. So first thing we said, um, if we are able to get it over a large distance, that would be quite advantageous because then, um, and so many of the current methods are not able to inject over a distance, let's say up to five meters. So if you're able to do that, then we have a niche product which we can actually apply underneath existing structures. So in 2005, we managed to change, well, uh, varying the flow rate and reaction rate of the reaction rate of the bacteria and the flow rate of the injection, we could pump in all our substrates over a distance of five meters in a column, and then let it react and show that we can actually strengthen uh, sand uh, over a distance of five meters. So that was quite a good achievement. But then uh, next stage was this is not yet uh, the full scale life is not a one D column. So how to move further? So the next step was trying to use actual injection uh, equipment, like using perforated pipes or um, with slots in there. Uh, we put them in a, in a big uh, one cubic meter tote, and then we started injecting substrates. And after several trials, we managed to get one block of sandstone. So um, uh, while doing this, I was lucky enough to have contractors on site, and they were looking at what we were doing. And they said, well, if you can do it on a one cubic meter scale, uh, they were happy to invest some funding and would do it on the yard, and they made a big sandbox in which we could play uh, with injection extraction strategies. So on the right side, you see here a large-scale experiment which we performed, having three injection wells on the left side and three extraction wells on the right side and a lot of monitoring wells within the center. And uh, in that box, we actually flushed some substrates <coughs> and... Um, during the flushing, we actually did some monitoring uh, using seismics. So we buried a cable of geophones at the base of this box, and then we applied some seismic shaking uh, at the surface. And after each flush, we did uh, a seismic analysis, and we saw that actually the shear wave velocity was going up, or actually the arrival time of the signal was going down, which indicated that the, sh the, the, the shear rate, well, which indicated that the bulk modulus was going up as well. So actually within five flushes, we could already see that we increased, well, it's not readable from the slide, but we increased the bulk modulus from about 35 megapascal to up to 10,000 megapascal. So it's a significant increase after five um, flushes. And actually, uh, we also proved that only one single flush would be enough to uh, in increase shear modulus, uh, which would be sufficient for like flush mitigation or, for example, uh, stabilizing the embankments underneath uh, railroad tracks. So uh, then we started excavating, and we, ex we um, discovered um, the cemented sandbox uh, or the cemented sand body, uh, which actually uh, showed uh, quite a good correspondence to the injection patterns within uh, the sandbox, which we uh, modeled using our theoretical models. Um, 
Although uh, for the cubic meter was solidified, within the solidified matter, there was quite some heterogeneity observed. So the strength ranged from some areas which hadn't seen any cementation to uh, cementation up to 12 to 15 megapascal in compressive, uncomplied compressive strength. Um, so based on those results, uh, well, having all those variability also enabled us to get some correlations. So we could correlate strength to calcium carbonate content, uh, but because we prepared the box just by scooping the sand in and don't really m uh, care about the homogeneity of the density in the sand, we got quite some variability of the initial density as well. So we actually found that the correlation with the final dry density is much better than with the actual uh, calcium carbonate content because of a var varying initial density before you start treatment. Um, so, having all these results, uh, various research again around the world, uh, they they made similar progress. Uh, so, at Montana State University, Adrian Phillips and consorts, uh, they they wrote a nice review paper and uh, visioned all the potential applications you could do with this kind of process. So, ranging from applications in the uh, oil and gas industry to uh, as well, soil stabilization is what we have been working on. Uh, the suppression. Uh, has been identified as a potential application, but also um, remediation of limestone buildings or applications in the environmental uh, area. So uh, there are various ideas with what we can do with this process once we have it uh, done. <laughs> um, however, the first application uh, I have been working with was on stabilizing a borehole for gas pipeline installation in a gravel layer. So when you try to install a pipeline uh, in a gravel layer using a horizontal directional drilling technique, uh, you may risk that your bentonite slurry will not form a cake, uh, and you may risk that the bore will collapse while you're pulling the pipeline through. So in order to prevent the collapse, uh, they suggested they may use by stabilization technique. So uh, for that, we had to go back to the lab because we never cemented gravel before, and we designed the procedure Eventually, I think it was, uh, we just flush it twice uh, with the uh, and strengthening solution. Uh, well, actually, when we did the pilot test in the container, we flushed it nine times and we drilled through. And we showed the client that we have an open hole which stays open, even without the bentonite story. So this was sufficiently con convincing to, uh, to have the client uh, funding a full-scale trial. So um, we applied the process in the field uh, while doing that. Uh, you see that actually what we consider to be a non-disturbing method still involves quite some equipment on site. So here we see the installation, uh, the injection wells and the extraction wells and some of the storage vessels, pumping systems, and and here uh, the, 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 the flow manifolds. So um, this equipment was necessary for the large-scale application. Eventually, we uh, treated about a corridor around the 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 plant uh, alignment for the pipeline uh, around 50 meters in length and 4 by 4 meters uh, in height and width uh, at a depth varying, ranging from 4 to 20 meters. So um, while doing the treatment, uh, we tried to do monitoring methods again, although the funding for doing full seismics was not available. But we did some resistivity uh, analysis. So electrical resistivity gives an impression about the salinity of the groundwater. And because the substrates we're using are containing calcium chloride and the product is ammonium chloride, which increase the salinity, uh, we could uh, sort of localize uh, where the liquids we injected would be in the subsurface. And we could actually see that the treatment was going through the whole area and particularly not lower than the, the intended area because we didn't want to lose all the liquids and we had to ensure for environmental considerations that we extract all the ammonium chloride. So um, afterwards, we tried to take samples, although taking samples at 20 meters depth was uh, proved to be quite difficult. Uh, so we got some backhoe taking uh, a, a trial trench, but because groundwater level was really close to surface, uh, it was very difficult to, to dig up a trench. So we had limited evidence, but we had some evidence that we had some lumps of cemented uh, sand. <laughs> so, uh, but actually, the contractor was quite happy because they could pull through the pipeline with no problems, and it came through on the other side. Uh, so quite a successful project there. Uh, for the contractor, however, for uh, for the scientists, of course, we have limited sufficient evidence to say 
yes, we've done it, or yes, we've done it, but we have no sufficient evidence that the actual methods uh, work sufficiently well. Uh, but still, we got quite some experience in developing the injection methods, uh, mixing methods, monitoring sampling methods. Uh, we proved that we can st strengthen sand and gravel, and we have several empirical correlations available for the field application. Uh, going back one, going too fast. Um, so yes, we, we have some uh, evidence. However, still, and I think this is still something we need to solve, uh, we have limited control, uh, so we don't get a full homogeneous uh, cemented sand body, although I wonder whether all the other techniques are proving that they actually can get a fully homogeneous cemented sand body, or whether that's actually necessary. So a uh, second issue we still have to work on. Uh, based on this first field trials, we estimated the cost of the uh, actual application of this technology about $400 uh, per cubic meter, and I see I have two minutes left, so I'll I'll probably stop here. Um, so uh, it's about $400 per cubic meters of soil. Um, so costs are mostly uh, between resources. So we still need some substrates, urea, calcium chloride. Um, uh, we produce ammonium chloride, which we need to remove, and we have to cultivate the bacteria. So those all are contributing to the cost besides all the mobilization of all the equipment, which is necessary. And we can still discuss the environmental impact because we still use resources and we still produce waste. We have to consider that environmental impact as well. So how to move forward? Um, so what is currently uh, being done? Uh, we have to either improve the technology we're currently working on to optimize it and reduce the cost here. There are several initiatives on the way. Uh, people have looked at alternative sources of enzymes. We're currently looking at that at Arizona State as well. Um, we look into alternative processes, which also result in calcium carbonate, but don't use these resources. So we may get some additional costs there. Uh, and we may have to look at alternative applications in which the homogeneity is not really required and the control is. Uh, so, for example, several applications we're currently thinking of is test suppression or beach stabilization or liquefaction mitigation, where you may not have to get a high strength or get a very homogeneous cementation. So with that, uh, considering the time, I think I'll leave it at this, and uh, I'm open for questions and answers. Thank you, Leon. Um, I think we have a few questions that came through here. Uh, no, um, oh, yeah, let me, let me. Can you see the questions, or do you want me to read I them to you? Uh, I can see the questions. I think we start, are there any environmental impacts, short or long term? Um, well, yes, still, still there are environmental impacts. Any method has environmental impact. So uh, to do a proper comparison, you really, it's sometimes it's difficult because uh, where do you put your system boundaries for uh, making a fair comparison between the methods? Uh, how long is the site available or not available? Um, so actually, uh, first we thought that the ammonium chloride production is a very big issue regarding uh, uh, environmental impact. But in some cases, it may not, because in fact, it's just a fertilizer. Well, when we applied it in the Netherlands, we, we over-fertilize our fields for the crops. So the farmers are being penalized by putting too much ammonia on their field. So in that case, we have quite a high impact there. But on another side, where we tried it on a coastal zone where they had oyster farms, they said, well, do it here because we're short in ammonia. And we actually provide a resource for them. So uh, the environmental impact is highly variable. And it depends on the location, and it depends on the comparison. Uh, does this method work only in sense? Uh, what fines content is allowable? Uh, current research shows that uh, some fines are allowable. Uh, so how much? I think up 10% and not more. Uh, you rely on the permeability of the soil. So in, in one way, uh, you have to be able to inject it by permeation. If the soil doesn't allow permeation, you may consider mixing. So some people have looked into mixing the substrates in. Um, for, for me, personally, I would say um, there you lose your competitive advantage compared to the alternative technologies. So if you only need to inject it over short distance, um, well, what is the com the question is what is then the advantage of using this compared to uh, more well, easily applicable techniques uh, or more proven techniques like jet crowding or mixing with polymers or something like that? Um, Next question is, is the method readily available, repeatable, to remote location around the globe? 
Can there be other methods available at those remote locations? Uh, is there cost comparison to the other methods? Uh, we're working on cost comparison. Uh, the actual cost uh, will depend significantly on the amount of cementation which is required um, so and the amount of strength which is required. Regarding remote locations, um, yeah, you have to be able to bring the substrates in. So I'm not sure. One of the processes we were looking at, for example, is using denitrification, which uses uh, waste from, from manure or waste from uh, croplands, uh, which we can convert into soluble compounds, which we inject in the ground and can stabilize it. So um, if, you, well, if that happens on a remote location, you may consider uh, to apply that. Um, and so I, I would say in terms of biostabilization methods, uh, so far I just presented one process and maybe we have looked at two or three other processes, but there's a lot of things we didn't look at and the amount of applications which may be, um, well, which, which we may consider as long as we allow in some cases a little bit more time of treatment. And for some applications that is the case. So for example, we currently are preparing a, a site for like infection mitigation, and they say, well, we may have several years before the earthquake comes, so you may have potentially uh, several years you can uh, slowly dose the substrates and strengthen our, our sand layers. So in that case, it's a totally different concept than the current ground improvement technologies, which uh, want to, well, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe over-exaggerating, they want to go in and out as fast as they can and treat as fast as possible. So that may require a, uh, a shift in, in mindset in order to consider these technologies as an alternative. Um, I think, did I, did I answer all the questions? A few more questions came through, Leon. I don't know if you want to go through them quickly or we, we have them maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, okay. Around the water yep. effect. Can you say it again? Uh, oh. One question, what about groundwater effects? Yeah. So uh, effects on the groundwater. So uh, the process which I presented was, um, well, you produce the ammonium chloride, uh, which, which if you remove it, there is no remaining, uh, remaining compounds in the groundwater, so there's no significant groundwater effects if you can remove the ammonium chloride. Uh, the other, other processes which we're looking at, they won't have a waste product. So if you balance the substrates and choose the right process, uh, well, you have to take them into account, but you can uh, ensure that they're, well, there are processes which have either a positive or a zero uh, effect on the groundwater quality. Um, the environmental concern was mentioned while injecting bacteria and substrate in the ground. How would they be addressed? So what we have typically encountered uh, presenting this type of work is that people feel that injecting bacteria in the ground may be, uh, well, at least worrisome for, for those people who are not familiar with it. Um, so other, there, several people have considered to move towards biostimulation, which means you just inject substrates in the ground and try to grow the already present indigenous bacteria which are out there. So um, that I think it's more a psychological uh, issue because uh, the bacteria which we inject also originate from soil. So uh, they are, in, in, in fact, harmless. And as soon as we stop the procedure, uh, you have some organic matter um, added to your soil, and um, they have no um, environmental um, or health-related issues with that. OK, we have to stop here, Leon. Uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation. Uh, we'll go back to uh, Jim Hudson. Can you push your slides, Jim, now? or? Let me give it a try here. There we go, I think. It might take a second to load. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the next speaker is Mr. James Hudson. He's the director at Keller Foundations. Go Thank ahead, Jim. Today. All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, today we'll, uh, we'll be discussing soil mixing, um, wet soil mixing specifically, and, and its uh, support for uh, ground supported liquid storage tanks on soft clays. Uh, I have to get my slides a little early there. Uh, first thing I just want to mention that uh, there are documents uh, available that govern tank design and allowable settlements from such entities as API and ACI. So those are available and give a lot of guidance on 
on uh, on storage tanks and their and what are allowable uh, movements. You know, such things as um, uh, total settlement, planar tilt, uh, differential settlements between like the edge and the center, as well as along the edge for um, for the actual tank uh, support. The um, and see here, good deal. The one of the things I want to mention was, uh, oops, let me see if I can get the animation. There we go. One of the things I want to mention is uh, for designing uh, tanks, it's not that dissimilar from any other geotechnical design that is done, uh, but there are some, some differences that need to be kept in mind. You're first obviously going to uh, do your exploration, your investigation that um, uh, one of the things here I'll mention is a couple things. One is that um, it is important to get good data for for doing um, strength data as well as uh, consolidation data, so you can do some good evaluation of of, of the materials, uh, the pre pre treatment uh, performance of the site and the tank. The um, so once you understand what the what the performance is untreated, then you go through and you start to uh, establish what are your allowables, and as I mentioned, API, ACI has some guidance documents related to that. The soil improvement scheme um, is where, you know, you start to get specifically with the soil improvement program, and, and Vern Schaefer earlier uh, spoke a bit about um, the geotech tools and how that can help you uh, start to zero in on some of the applicable options that are available. And, the, and finally, we're talking about uh, establishing testing criteria. Um, one of the big things with soil mixing is is QAQC, and and uh, I'll go through some of that today. We'll we'll look at that, but that's important to do um, to good quality control and, and quality assurance during the process, and that way you can you can feel uh, assured that you you're getting the the product and the performance that you're looking for. Now I, I touched on it during this design part, but one of the things that may appear obvious but sometimes gets overlooked is is because of the size of the loading that you're talking about, um, and here we're going to be looking in this um, project, we're going to be looking at 300-foot plus or minus di uh, foot diameter tanks. Um, they have significant stress influences uh, to significant depths. So if you're talking about 300-foot diameter tank, uh, you're looking at, you know, well beyond the diameter of the tank in depth, so 300 foot in depth. So you need to keep that in mind as you're doing your exploration and your testing, and we'll look at that in a little more detail uh, in, in a bit. The, again, as Vern talked about, um, you know, geotech tools, there are a lot of different technologies that are available for, for foundation support and for soil improvement. So, you know, all of them have pluses and minuses, strengths and weaknesses. Um, and, uh, you know, being aware of those and, and where, where they can be used and not used is, is important to try to zero in on, on the optimal solution. Um, the geotech tools look primarily at technical issues, although they get a little bit into giving you some ideas on, on uh, costs. But, you know, for any project, uh, there are a lot of different aspects that come into play, and cost is obviously important. Um, Something that is technically acceptable gives a technical performance that you need. Um, there's also risk, there's schedule, and a lot of those come into play as well. Um, and we'll talk about those in a little more detail in this project. But it's, with this project, we'll be looking at, and maybe a little difficult to see on that slide, but wet soil mixing is, is the primary application here. Um, there are other types of soil mixing, dry soil mixing. There's jet grouting, which is a type of soil mixing as opposed to mechanically mixing using. Uh, a pneumatic mixing, the, um, and then there are different tools that can be used to do um, uh, soil mixing. So not only column mixing, which we'll look at, but we'll also look at mass mixing, which Vern talked about also, um, that was used to create a um, work platform or a load transfer platform on this project. The So just talking briefly about um, wet soil mixing, just to give a little background, and it's just mechanically mixing the soils in place. The um, let's see, is the animation work? Yeah, maybe not. Okay. So just taking a mixing tool and shearing the soil and mixing it with a binder, and uh, most commonly it's a cement-based binder. 
um, and and the common uses there are stated usually to increase um, increase uh, burial capacity, decrease settlement, and very common. It also been, has been used historically to mitigate liquefaction potential and the other other uh, applications you see there. And as I uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, to do wet soil mixing, there are a lot of different tools that are available. Um, Again, yeah, we're going to talk about the center one here, a column mixing, uh, but also we're going to talk about mass mixing, which is there on your left, uh, and that has a drum-shaped um, tool that has mixing blades around the perimeter of it, and uh, as it's done, um, a track goes used to move that tool through the soil mass and cement the soils. There are also other type of technologies that can build panels or walls, such as the um, tooling that's off on your right there. The one of the other things I want to mention is the soil mixing guidelines are available. Besides the, um, uh, let's see if I push that slide, and seem to want to go. Okay, the um, um, both DFI has soil mixing guidelines as well as uh, FHWA, and uh, there are uh, European guidelines such as the German um, Institute for St uh, Standardization. And those are all available there, as you can see. Uh, should be available, and, and you can find them online. The um, Soil Creek properties are, uh, oops, I don't know where it went there. There we go, okay, very good. Soil Creek properties are a function of the in-situ soils. Um, because the soil becomes a part of the final material, which we, uh, the industry has kind of adopted the name Soil Creek, the mixture of the in-situ soil with, with the binder, um, degradation of the soil, plasticity, water content, contaminants, if there are contaminants to site, those need to be taken into account uh, and how they will affect the final soil creek properties. And also organic content is also a, a critical aspect of it. The, um, now, besides just those properties, the variability of the materials um, of the soils are important to know because uh, your soil creek will vary with your variability of soil conditions. So it's good to do a detailed geotechnical exploration um, to understand all these aspects. And um, and the other thing that we want to chat about is um, um, actually doing a pre-construction laboratory testing program uh, that um, will confirm what your anticipated um, parameters are of your soils. So it's often referred to as a bench scale test. Uh, it's a testing, uh, just a laboratory mix design program in essence, but this is using soil actually from the site and from different depths. So as part of the exploration, sometimes done as part of the exploration, sometimes done as a follow-up, uh, some site work, uh, you have to actually uh, get soil pro uh, up to maybe a five-gallon bucket of a different soil that you'll want to use in the laboratory to mix with different amounts of binder. So you do different um, different binder factors and and confirm that you're actually getting the strengths that you anticipate with the different soil materials. So you can check that. And this slide will give you some ideas on some types of, of uncompacted compressive strengths that you can achieve with different amounts of binder, um, as well as uh, shear strengths, tensile strengths, and Poisson's ratio. Uh, okay, next slide. The important operational parameters is also something else that needs to be uh, considered. The, um, as I mentioned, quality control, quality assurance are an important part of, of any soil mixing program. Uh, one of the things to look at is something referred to as the binder uh, rotation number. So this is a feel for, well, not feel, it actually measures the amount of mixing that is performed in the ground. Um, some types of mixing uh, that is performed for, especially for environmental type applications, is cement is just broadcast on the ground and a backhoe bucket is used to kind of mix it up and all. And, and that can be effective in those types of applications. But when you're actually creating structural elements in the ground, uh, it's very important to make sure you're getting the quality that you need and the consistency that you need. So there are a number of operational parameters that are um, that are uh, important to measure and to confirm that you're achieving. Um, let's see. 
want to just uh, confirm, uh, Jose, you can see the slides advancing now. Okay. The uh, Another parameter that's they, important. Uh, they're is stuck on, uh, on the DFI and the FHWA. I thought you had to move beyond that. Oh, yes, well beyond it. Um, so the slides are stuck. You're not seeing it? I, this, the slide I see is the one that shows the DFI and the FHWA publications. Okay. Uh, that's slide 9, and I'm on slide 14, and it's showing on mine. Let me see here. I don't know if I'm the only one. Okay. Yep. Okay. Let me yep. see Thank here. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, double check in here. All right, I should be, there we go. Let's see if it pulls up here. Sorry for that. Mm, all right. Um, one other, I'm going to back up one slide here. And one other uh, of the operational parameters is important to measure is the drilling index. And this gives you an idea based on the crowd index and the rot uh, rotary index. It gives you an idea based on your crowd pressure and your feed rate and your rotary pressure and your RPMs of your equipment. Uh, it gives a, a good indication of the soil type that you're actually shearing. And this is important for a few reasons. Uh, and probably the main one is uh, there's usually a termination depth that you need to achieve. So the... Um, this will give the operator a good uh, reading on when he's at the proper stratum that he wants to uh, terminate in, and it also creates a documentation that that, that was achieved. So now we're going to go ahead and, uh, with that background, we'll start talking about this specific project. And, again, these are the liquid storage tanks, uh, a farm in Louisiana. And this project is particularly uh, interesting because um, it it uh, is a large tank farm that was constructed over many years, and uh, tanks offer a very uh, interesting, specific uh, case history in that um, you both can do a load test on these tanks. So when you do your hydro test, to do a full-scale load test, and you know precisely what your load is uh, because you, you have a, a liquid that you're filling it with with a known unit weight, and uh, you can do these tests and, and, and uh, load the full foundation. Um, the, this, this farm, there were 21, uh, approximately 300-foot diameter tanks constructed. And there were a variable soil profile, which we'll look at here in a second. But in essence, we had soft materials uh, extending down to about 70 feet in depth. So the, the, the soil profile should be coming up here, yes. So this will give you an idea. And you can see the different layers. They're kind of um, with the heavy lines, horizontal lines, and it breaks it up. Uh, an upper clay layer, um, an upper sand layer next beneath it, and then a middle clay layer. And that clay, middle clay layer was a layer that extended down to approximately 70 feet, and that's how deep the treatment was. So the treatment um, uh, terminated in the lower, lower sand layer. Um, the deeper clays... Um, were firm enough and, and, and um, stiff enough to allow uh, proper performance of the tanks. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, bench scale testing was one of the most important things uh, that we did. Um, they actually took samples and mixed it with, with, um, with different binder contents to confirm that we could get the strengths and stiffnesses that we needed. Um, the, the, the program was, there we go, a grid of soil mix columns. Uh, the interesting thing about this also is that a relieving platform was constructed with mass soil mixing. So the top material, oops, backing up on me. The top material was uh, was mixed for both a working platform to provide a stable working platform for the equipment, the rigs, but then also to uh, to help support a provide a uniform support for the tank foundation on top of the soil mix columns. So based on this and doing an evaluation, predicted the edge settlement uh, over 30 years. You can see here approximately 20 inches um, maximum edge settlement. And beneath the center of the tank, 
approximately twice that, a little over 40, 45 inches of sediment beneath the center of the tank. The interesting thing to see in this slide, back up on me, interesting thing to see on this slide of the center is that the influence of the tanks um, beyond the perimeter of the tanks. So we actually have settlements that occur on the order of 100 feet outside the perimeter of the tanks. Um, this is important to keep in mind when you have a tank farm and you have adjacent tanks, that loading of one tank affect potentially um, the edges of the adjacent tanks. So that has to be taken into account into the, in the design. Um, one of the other things that's important to do is global uh, is a stability, edge stability calculation to confirm that not only your settlements, but that you've got uh, the strengths, the shear strengths. And, and here you can see on this tank, we had a uh, factor of safety of 1.39 was the minimum. Um, that top treated zone 70 feet up top, so it, uh, because that was treated, uh, it drove the failure plane down, down quite a, at quite a depth, and we would get the factor of safety that was required. The other thing that was uh, interesting uh, evaluation that had to be performed was in the soil mix um, load transfer platform. And actually, look at the deformations that are, were um, were expected, were anticipated within that platform to make sure that the shear uh, excuse me, that the tensile strength of that material was not exceeded, and that evaluation was done. So once all the evaluation was done, then we went down to actually performing the, the uh, construction program. And I'm waiting for the slide to advance here. For some reason, it's, there we go. Um, uh, you know, initially started with the mass mixing to look at uh, creating that platform, both for working platforms for heavy equipment, as well as uh, the load transfer platform, then following up with the column mixing beneath the footprint of the tanks. Uh, what, during the work, during that work, uh, we talked about quality control and quality assurance that is necessary. Um, there's one of the things that's very important with column mixing and soil mixing is um, actually monitoring the work that's being performed in the rigs now have uh, on board DEX and data acquisition systems that gives the operator on the left side there, you'll see a screen the operator actually sees in the cab, and he actually monitor all those important uh, operational parameters that we talked about. So you can see that, in, and on the right side is an actual printout that is it can be um, performed, it can be retrieved from the system as well as all the systems on a database and can be evaluated. So he can actually see his rotation, his blade rotation numbers, his, his penetration rates, everything is right there available so he can make real-time adjustments if necessary while he's doing the work. Um, the other thing that uh, important quality, um, quality control aspect of the work is actually retrieving wet samples right after the construction. So we have, uh, there are probes that can be lowered into the ground, sampling devices that you lower in the ground that uh, retrieve samples from different depths. So at different depths, different soil layers throughout the column, retrieving samples, bringing them back in, casting um, cylinders, and going ahead and doing uh, laboratory testing of those actual um, actual wet samples that were retrieved from the columns. The other aspect of, of the quality control that is performed is actual coring of the completed uh, hardened columns. So you can actually measure what the um, uh, what how the material hardened in the ground, how it cured, and what strengths you got out of, out of the final product. The, um, apologize, I got to click on these slides a little earlier. And then once, once the program is performed, then a uh, cathodic protection program uh, uh, system is, is put in, in place uh, with some clean mortar sand. You can see in the background there that work being done. Now, one of the things that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that is and nice about these tanks is that they hydro test the tanks to confirm that they're performed well. And, uh, and you can actually monitor both uh, the floor of the tank through the legs as well as the perimeter of the tank and actually see well, how the settlements are uh, for all those different um, settlement um, uh, allowances that are through API. Actually, Jim, I'm sorry, but I think you need to uh, wrap things up because otherwise we won't have any time for questions. Good deal. Okay, I'm, I got one slide left, I think. Um, looking at uh, settlement with time, uh, um, graphs to the right, um, the 30 year settlement prediction on the right, and then the bottom is the first 10 years in measurements. And 
the, I'm down to the last slide here. Let's see if I can pull that up. And this will show settlement measurements that were performed uh, over a, about a 13 year period. Uh, let's see, it should pop up there. And there we are. So we actually have settlement measurements over approximately 13 years. And you can see the predicted in green and the actual measured. One of the reasons that it's hard to get um, real uh, good measurements long term is because the tanks do not maintain 100% full the whole time. They're uh, filled and, and uh, drained regularly. So you don't have 100% loading over the tank. And that final picture there shows the tank farm. You can actually see the roofs on the tanks and how they're at different levels. So that's part of it. And with that, I'll go ahead and switch over to questions and okay. see what we got. Um, yeah, I think we have a few questions here for you, Jim. Okay, good deal. Um, I guess there's one question. How thick was the pad at the top required to provide a stable base for the vehicles, and what was the cement content? Um, What's that? Yeah, yeah the, um, the actual thickness of the working pad on top was approximately three meters. Um, it was both for stability but also um, uh, for, for providing the load transfer platform based on the diameter and the spacing of the columns. Um, the um, cement co contact uh, content, I think we can go back to, to our slide here and you can see what we ended up with. Let me pull it up here. Yeah, cement content is not showing, I was gonna pull that up. Apologize, I do not have that. I'll look for that for one second and we'll pull back up. What's the next uh, question you have there, Jose? And why, why is that pad the result of mixing cement with the upper clay, clay layer? What was the, what, I'm sorry? Why is that pad, you know, the pad uh, to provide oh, the stable pad. base? Why is that pad the result of mixing cement with the upper clay layer? Yes, yes, that's correct. I saw, yeah, that was mass mixing. So the actual 10 feet of soil was mixed with the binder and to create that pad. So it was actually mixed in place. That's correct. Um, I see another question. What other methods were considered for soil improvement? Um, uh, the, um, the, the, the actually the interesting thing about this project, uh, because it was over many years, is that several different methods were used. Um, stone columns combined with width drains were used, shallower stone columns and width drains, um, and also some shallow soil mixing along with width drains. Um, as we talked about earlier, um, time is a, a big part of, of an evaluation of what systems to use. And, and uh, with, as you can imagine, with oil storage tanks, uh, time is very important and, and uh, can make a big impact on cost for the owner. So uh, over the uh, development of these sites, um, a, a system that we just looked at, which turned out to be a little more expensive to actually construct, ended up giving them tank performance uh, much quicker. Uh, so it saved them more money on the project in, in, at the end as opposed to using a less expensive construction method that took longer to preload and pre-consolidate. Okay. I think we have to leave it at that, Jim, because we are running out of time here. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So the next uh, presentation will be by Mr. Brandon Bushmeyer. I don't know, Brandon, if you can uh, push your slides there. And uh, Brandon is Director of Engineering for Menard Group USA. All right. Uh, I think I pushed my slides. Can you see those okay? Yes. All right, excellent. Hello everyone, uh, Jose, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as indicated, my name is Brandon. I'm joining you all here today to present on behalf of Menard Group USA. And I'd like to thank the Geo Institute for allowing us to speak here today on the topic of soil improvement. Today I'll be reviewing a case study for the design and installation of column support and embankments, or we refer to them as CSES. CSCS with CMC rigid inclusions are a frequent application of ground improvement around the worldwide, around the world where soft soils are encountered. Uh, whether it be new highways, roadway widenings, or new bridge abutments, oftentimes we must build these atop less than ideal soils 
where we anticipate high deformation. Uh, these deformations need to be controlled to ensure that the stability and long-term performance of the roadway, the MSC walls, uh, and the drainage components are handled appropriately. Uh, in years past, project teams might have opted to use, uh, for example, a two-stage MSC wall with a waiting period. Uh, others might have considered some lightweight fill or maybe foam blocks. Uh, yet CSES oftentimes offers a, a more economical solution that can maintain the critical project schedules and avoid surcharge and waiting periods. Uh, today we're going to review such a project, uh, the design, installation, and analysis of CSES at the 295-76 Route 42 direct connection, whereas the, the Philadelphians commonly refer to it, the 10-year-long construction mess on our way to the shore. Just a quick uh, overview here to align everyone's expectations for the discussion. Uh, as this is a case study, I'll quickly review the background and site challenges and we'll examine the soil profile briefly, identify the need for some type of ground improvement, and then we'll review our CMC rigid inclusion ground improvement design, including some outputs from those efforts, followed by a brief review of the testing and wall monitoring program, which are two hallmarks of a great quality control package. Uh, the setup that you see on the right, that picture, uh, is what we're going to use to install CMC rigid inclusions. These are a drilled displacement column that displaces the soil laterally as you advance the auger and the Kelly bar down into the ground. And by displacing the soil laterally, you, you in, improve the soil uh, by some marginal amount. Um, until you reach a bearing stratum, at which point you withdraw the auger and the setup and grout the column in place. These are unreinforced uh, grouted columns that are left in the, in the soil to help improve the characteristics of the soil. The project location um, is shown here on the map. This direct connection is a multi-phase, nine-year, $900 million highway improvement project, the last time we checked, in Camden County, New Jersey. And as you can see from the map, it's located just southeast of downtown Philadelphia, uh, just across the Delaware River. A construction for the massive project has been divided up over four main contracts due to the complexity of the interchanges and the corresponding roadway phasing. So for contract one, the New Jersey Department of Transportation and Dewberry Consultants specified a design build column supported embankment system to control the settlement and accelerate construction of six mechanically stabilized MSC wall embankments, totaling nearly one mile in length and reaching wall heights up to 34 feet. The approved CSES design consisted of a ground improvement system requiring approximately 6,000 controlled modulus column rigid inclusions and a two to four foot thick load transfer platform. Similarly, for contract two, the team specified a design build system uh, to control settlement again, but this time for nine mechanically stabilized earth walls reaching heights of upwards of 40 feet. The approved CSES design for this particular section consisted of approximately 5,000 more controlled modulus column rigid inclusions. Menard's team designed and installed these rigid inclusions for both contracts over the course of five years and several mobilizations. And additionally, Menard installed, performed, and evaluated 17 static load tests CMC rigid inclusions. Um, currently, uh, contract three is underway, and uh, contract four has not yet bid, so we're going to just go ahead and refer to this project as about halfway complete, at least from our perspective. All right. So the ultimate goal for the project was to fix a major highway flaw. If you were traveling east or west along 295, the current configuration would require you to merge onto I-76 Route 42 in Belmar, New Jersey. This created congestion and extremely dangerous stretch of roadway. 
Additionally, as you see on the plan north section, there was a tight radius turn on this project site known as Alja's Curve, which continued to cause traffic incidents and slowdowns through this region. Uh, the final configuration on the right will allow for the commuters on the 295 to fly over the other major highway, as you might expect it, and prevent issues with traffic merging and congestion. As with any project site, there were a number of challenges that we needed to face related to the construction process. Uh, when working on highways, the name of the game is pretty much shown here on the slide. It's imperative that construction staging is carefully vetted during bid and tender stage. Small work areas, proximity to traffic, water control, accessibility, and other factors absolutely must be considered when you plan each and every work area. Successful projects are such due to the time and effort spent planning before we ever set foot onto the project sites. Uh, the soil profile across the site is actually quite homogeneous, uh, consisting of loose to medium dense sand over soft silt and clay over stiff to very stiff silt and clay. In some areas, we had a dense sand layer that was present right below the very stiff silt and clay, but that wasn't typically considered. Uh, the soft upper silt and clay is relatively compressible and has low undrained shear strength. And this was primarily the layer of concern and why ground improvement was selected for this project to support the MSC walls. The lower silt and clay is stiffer and more competent with an estimated undrained shear strength somewhere around 3,000 PSF. Uh, SPTs performed during the initial investigation show end values that range from 0 to 10 for the upper soft clay and somewhere between 15 to 25 for the lower stiff silt and clay layers. There are also a few special areas of the project site where new fill was being placed over some soft marsh and swamp deposits, and these regions required special attention in the design phase to ensure stability and proper deformation control. As I said, despite the, the relative homogeneous soil profile, we still had to contend with variations in working elevation, existing grade, uh, MSC wall geometries. Uh, they required us to have a high level of refinement for our CSCS design. When you work across massive stretches of roadway, it's not possible to just simply homogenize the approach into a, a singular simplified case. So changes in fill height, existing soil condition, and the MSC wall configuration will be occurring in both the transverse and longitudinal directions. And so proper boring coverage is essential, and we often augment the information that we receive in the contract with our own CPTs and borings. So that way we're ensuring that we're capturing the subtle variations in the design scenarios that are present. And as you see in these two soil profile, these stretches along the roadway, um, each of these lines represent demarcations between the various soil profiles at depth, but then, of course, the new proposed grade, as you can see, is the top line is changing significantly over the length of the roadway. Uh, the design criteria for this project targeted settlement values at the base of the embankment of up to two and a half inches during construction with one inch of additional post-construction settlement, which is fairly typical for these types of builds. Differential settlement was also a key focus during the design because we wanted to ensure we had equal settlement plans across the, the various regions and cross sections. NJDOT and Dewberry consultants specified a thorough geotechnical monitoring program to help evaluate the performance of the CSES consisting of settlement monitoring platforms, uh, deformation monitoring points, vertical inclinometers, earth pressure cells, and geogrid within the LTM that was instrumented with strain gauges. A quick review of a rigid inclusion system is necessary to help illustrate the concept um, of the design for this project. CMC rigid inclusions are installed into soft soils and down into a dense stiff soil at depth to help control deformations and offer an improved soil response surface. And we're able to control the load that enters the soil and the rigid inclusion by varying the spacing and the diameter of the CNC rigid inclusion, while also modifying the load transfer platform or LTP configuration. 
This granular surficial load transfer platform helps to distribute the load between the soil and the rigid inclusions depending on the stiffness of the subsoil and the spacing diameter selected. So as some load enters the soil at the surface, as you see on the right, the soil actually begins to settle more than the CMC rigid inclusion for the upper portion of the profile. Because of this, the soil drags down on the rigid inclusion through negative skin friction. At the neutral axis, the rigid inclusion is at a point of maximum load and the inclusion and soil are expected to settle equally. Below that neutral axis, the opposite occurs. Now we expect the rigid inclusion to be moving more than the surrounding soil, generating positive skin friction as load transfers back into the soil and into a suitable bearing layer of depth. It's precisely this interaction that we look to test when we perform our static load test. Uh, to help control settlement for the project tolerances, our team uses a variety of tools. Most importantly, we're using a dynamic element modeling software. Programs such as Plaxis provide us with quick, accurate ways to modelize this complex soil structure interaction described in the previous slide. So we can vary the mesh spacing. We can vary the LTP details, including the thickness, the inclusion of geogrid. We can vary the rigid inclusion diameters and the depths to hone in on the appropriate settlement performance. These simple, single spacing, axisymmetrical models like the one shown on the right allow for us to perform a quick study of these interactions and provide excellent estimations for our team. We use these models to, to carefully study each of the scenarios present, and that's going to include sensitivity checks on the soil parameters in the case that maybe we aren't particularly confident in a soil layer stiffness. We also have to check various fill scenarios, working bench configurations, and changes in the site soil profile. And then using those tools, we can calculate upper and lower bound values across each design area and interpolate between them to arrive at spacings and diameters for the remaining gaps in our design. Uh, to help evaluate the edge effects and the lateral movement of the CSES due to the non-uniform loading conditions that are present with most MSC walls, 2D plane strain and 3D models are performed and compared to an AXI model. Now, the plane strain and 3D models are comprised of a larger portion of the embankment with multiple rigid inclusions across the dimensions to help evaluate the interaction of the system as a whole. In addition, they are allow us to estimate flexural forces in the rigid inclusions, which may be present if the rigid inclusions near the wall face are impacted by high overtoning moments or lateral movements during or after wall construction. Sliding and bearing hand calculations are also going to be completed each wall on the site in accordance with ASHTO LRFD bridge design specs. Um, GeoGrid was required for this project to resist sliding for the highest portion of several of the MSC walls. And of course, the strength of that GeoGrid was, was going to vary based on the wall height. Uh, global stability analysis checks are performed at the highest wall sections where the required buried pressures are the greatest. Uh, the internal stability of the wall is left to the designer of the actual wall system themselves. So we're only looking at the potential failure surfaces below the load transfer platform. And then, of course, we're checking various deep-seated failure surfaces within the native soil. And we use a limit equilibrium program such as SLIDE to ensure that we had appropriate factors of safety during the undrained, drained, and seismic conditions. Now, with these types of projects, special attention is required to make sure that we're managing complicated CSCS geometries. So it's imperative that we provide clean and clear details to the earthwork contractors regarding the construction and placement of the load transfer platform. And this includes how to handle the steps in the elevation of the load transfer platform. Of course, geogrid and geotextile placement has to be carefully planned and indicated on the working drawings. And additionally, the project team has to verify and review impacts on old and new structures that are adjacent to the CSES areas since the entire concept of this CSCS system is to share the load with the soil up to an acceptable amount, we must all work to identify what impacts that 
limited settlement might have on other components of the project site. Uh, for contract one, we installed 10 rigid inclusion load tests, and for contract two, an additional seven that were performed per ASTM D1143 quick test to help validate our design assumptions for the CMC load capacity. Deflection at the top of the CMC is monitored at each load increment, and strain gauges were installed in each load test to, de to determine that load sharing characteristics over the depth of the column. These data points were really useful in evaluating the bearing layer competency and, of course, the shaft resistance of each of the soil layers. Uh, the Davidson offset limit was also was used to determine the loads at which the shaft resistance could be calculated. Although the project soils were relatively homogenous, the insulation elevations, the fill heights, and, of course, corresponding design loads vary across the work areas, and therefore, not all of the CMCs have the same design load, which is illustrated in this test overview. Um, the failure of that load test column and associated deflection was estimated using this Davison offset limit, and then we compare that, of course, to the Plaxis models. Uh, just a, a quick overview, for contract one, NJDOT and Dewberry specified a geotech monitoring program to evaluate CSES consistent of the following different types of monitoring or settlement plates, deformation monitoring points, earth pressure cells, uh, strain gauges within the LTM and the geogrid, and vertical inclinometers. Nine of those earth pressure cells were placed within the LTM, um, and four were placed above the columns, while five were placed halfway between the columns. And as you would expect, the earth pressure cells that were located above the CMCs indicated significantly higher pressure than those in between, um, which, which clearly show that the LTM arching was working as we designed. And they, those results aligned well with the modeling predictions. Here's a nice overview. It's tough to see the explicit detail here, but the final settlement platform and deformation monitoring points here give you a really good indication of how the actual results compared with the Plaxis analysis that was provided in the design package. Um, as expected, the deformation monitoring points, which were on the face of the MSC walls, they generally deflect less than the corresponding settlement platforms that are at the top of the LTM within the embankment. Um, settlement platforms tend to get hit during construction, and so the results oftentimes jump back and forth, um, so it's sometimes difficult to get good information from those. But overall, the predictions from the Plaxis model aligned well with the performance in the field. Okay, so very quickly here, we'll go over quality control before wrapping up. Um, so to confirm the consistency and quality of all of the installed rigid inclusions, Menard uses an onboard computer system that tracks these parameters during the drilling penetration and grouting of the hole. They include the length and diameter of the column, the rotational speed, the torque, the pull-down pressure, or as we refer to it, crowd pressure, the rotary pressure, speed of penetration and withdrawal, and of course, the overbreak percentage on the theoretical grout volume. Now, rotational speed measures the rotary head as it spins, and that's a good indication of, of the consistency of a layer, as well as the speed of penetration, which measures the auger advancement. Uh, the downward thrust, or crowd, is a pressure measurement from the drill's hydraulic system, and all of these items and other parameters can be observed by the driller in real time with the computer monitoring system. And together, we can use those to help determine when we've achieved the design embedment into the target stratum. It's upon that criteria that we, we do our first QAQC process. In addition to that, of course, um, in this particular project, column integrity testing was specified on many of the inclusions. Of course, the single element load testing we spoke about earlier. One of the critical components, of course, is LTP compaction testing, since the entire premise of the system relies on the ability of the LTP to transmit load. It's imperative that good testing um, is completed on that layer. And then, of course, unconfined compressive strength testing on the inclusion, rigid inclusion grout before it's placed. Uh, Brandon, we need, oh, okay, all right. How about that for timing? <laughs> so we, conclude, 
the uh, CSDS system met the required sediment tolerances, and um, we got really great data from the M M instrumented MSC walls, which are, are obviously much better than the actual single element load test to help determine overall performance. We met criteria for bearing capacity and sliding, and of course, there was excellent quality control on this project to ensure successful completion of multiple phases of work. So just a quick thanks to everyone involved in the project, to the NJDOT, Dewberry, uh, GI Consultants, PKF Mark III, and Conti, the two contractors we worked with, and of course the Minerd design team, Nina Carney and Taylor Toll, as well as Sarah Ramp and Kyle Schatzer, who aren't included on the slide here. I guess with that, we'll open it up for questions. I see no questions here for you, Brandon. Uh, oh, the easy. I guess the easy one. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I have one one easy question for you here. So, when you sure. did, uh, are these uh, columns? Are they? They're not reinforced, are they? Typically. Yeah. That's a good they question. Are. So, they, these these columns in particular were not reinforced. Um, we, we did not have high lateral deformations at the surface uh, that required any type of reinforcement in the outer rows of the columns. Oftentimes on embankments, um, maybe the outer two to three rows of columns at the edge of the MSC wall may require some type of reinforcement to help handle uh, lateral deformations there. And of course, some of the bending moments that are introduced into the column. Right, and I guess my question also is that if you're if you're designing this in a seismic type of uh, a site that is subject to seismic loading, I guess you also have to to address that, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, many of the projects that that we've been using this, particularly, uh, have been in the eastern U.S. and some. Uh, most of which have not been in seismic zones, but in the event that you're looking at those types of projects, yes, probably some type of reinforcement would be required on the columns. Okay. Of course, it would be project dependent. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I see no questions here, so uh, thank you very much, Brandon, for the presentation. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity. All right, and we'll move on to the last presentation of the session here. And uh, the last presenter is Dr. Armin Studlein. Sorry, Armin, if I mis mispronounce your name. Uh, Armin is Associate Professor in the School of Civil and Construction Engineering at Oregon State University. Thank you very much. Uh, Jose, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Very good, and uh, it looks like my slides are coming up. Please let me know if you can see them. Can everybody see the slides there? I, I can see the slides, yeah. Okay, great. So um, to wrap up this uh, session, um, I wanted to give a quick overview of some research we've completed in the last couple years, uh, which are now being used in, in practice. So we have uh, some, an application of uh, driven displacement piles um, that I want to talk about uh, just to give a sense of of uh, one of the possible ways to mitigate liquefaction uh, hazards with driven displacement piles. So I'll give you a quick background here. Um, there are obviously there are advantages and limitations to, to the use of timber piles, uh, but with regards to advantages, um, uh, the material is relatively cheap, and I particularly like that you can grow your ground improvement. I think one of the things we see is uh, cementitious materials are, um, you know, contributing to some of the carbon in the atmosphere uh, and, and usage. Uh, so considering, especially on the West Coast, some sustainable construction methods is becoming obviously uh, desirable. Uh, obviously, you need to select the right methodology and technique for the project, and, and I don't think sustainability should be the overriding factor. Um, in part, one of the nice things about uh, driven piles is that we can tell an awful lot by their installation, right? A driven pile is a tested pile. Um, and so we, we can observe the driving resistance, and that can be used to confirm densification during installation, although I always recommend some post 
uh, identification um, verification tests. Um, the, how this approach works is that you're displacing material to produce the densification, but um, you're also providing a structural member that has tensile resistance. Uh, we just heard in a question in the last uh, presentation uh, that if you're in a seismic zone with the uh, rigid inclusions that you'll need to add uh, uh, some uh, structural steel uh, to handle potential flexure and shear, uh, well, this material it comes right along with it. it. It's tensile resistant. So that is one of the advantages. You're providing two modes of improvement. Uh, now, naturally, if you're going to also use the pile for structural support, you really should find a competent bearing layer for the toe. But in the application I'm going to talk about, we took the approach of developing a non-liquefiable crust thickness sufficient to uh, produce a life safety condition. Uh, so in other words, the structure was floated on a non-liquefiable crust in order to achieve the design uh, requirements. So that's a nice way to go. Uh, finally, uh, we've shown that uh, the timber piles can effectively uh, reduce excess pore pressures compared to uh, a non-improved zone and reduce the deformations. Um, okay, so let's move forward and just give a quick uh, overview of how we might go about um, uh, designing for liquefaction mitigation. Let's say uh, you're using the, the CPT to evaluate liquefaction triggering. And let's say this red dot shows the pre-improvement assessment for triggering for a given soil layer. Um, so one way to mitigate liquefaction is to increase the cyclic resistance through densification. Uh, another approach is to reduce the cyclic shear stresses uh, applied to the soil, and that might be by some shear stress redistribution. Uh, my preference is to uh, do both, which is to increase the CRR and decrease the CSR, and, and this is a possible dual mechanistic approach through uh, with vibro replacement, for example, or displacement piles, whether they're driven or there are other, some kind of drill displacement piles. So I, I do like uh, these, this approach. Um, okay, so what I want to do now is talk briefly about the experimental research program that was conducted uh, here at Oregon State University with partners in South Carolina, uh, namely the South Carolina chapter of the PDCA. Um, and what our objectives were, were to compare the densification and reinforcement effects. So the reinforcement effect is the shear stress redistribution of both conventional timber piles, but also conven uh, piles that were fitted with PVDs uh, to aid densification in more siltier zones. Um, and then look at the variables of different pile spacing or area replacement ratio, the effect of adding that PVD drainage, and what uh, time rate effects that could be observed with regard to densification. Um, we also wanted to evaluate the generation and dissipation of excess pore pressures and the consequences of those excess pore pr pressures in terms of post-liquefaction settlements, and we were able to do that with a controlled blasting program. Uh, and we wanted to evaluate the shear strain compatibility assumption. Uh, I can't go through all of these, uh, 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 the results of the, of the research here with the time we have, but everything's been published, uh, and you can see a list of the research project products that came out of this work. And, of course, you can always feel free to email me if you'd like a copy of the, uh, of the papers. Okay, so our test site was in South Carolina, uh, in, in the town of Hollywood, South Carolina. Uh, this is pretty close to Charleston. It's about 17 kilometers west of Charleston um, in an area that's been studied extensively with regard to liquefaction following the Charleston 1886 earthquake. Um, if we zoom in on our test site, uh, we essentially had uh, two test areas. One test area was where we uh, had the timber piles with five different zones uh, of treatment. And then we had a, what we call a control zone. You can see that on the right-hand side where uh, we would evaluate the consequences of liquefaction for an unimproved uh, portion of the site. Each of the five zones um, uh, generally looked like a five-by-five five pile group. 
And prior to installing the pile group, we pushed five CPTs shown in the uh, triangles here, one in the center and then four at the corners of the, of the second ring of piles there. Uh, we also collected shear wave velocity data as well as um, one boring for each of the improvement zones. Um, one thing is when you're doing a densification program, uh, you really don't want to put a lot of large holes into the ground, so we really relied on the CPT. Uh, naturally, that gives us a better resolution of the, con of the conditions uh, in the improved ground. Uh, so we for use this data to form a, a basis for the subsurface model uh, and evaluate the baseline conditions prior to densification. And if we look across uh, approximately 150 feet, including the uh, treated zones and the control zone, uh, what you can see is a relatively consistent uh, stratigraphy of relatively constant thickness across the site, so it was quite ideal uh, for us for our for the research program. Naturally, there is a bit of variation within a given layer, uh, but um, what we wanted to do uh, is focus on the liquefaction susceptibility of the uh, layer that extends from about two to 11 meters, and we deduced that the initial relative density was on the order of 40 to 50 percent. Uh, it's relatively clean in the upper two to three meters, and then it grades to um, kind of interbedded clean and silty sand. Um, okay, so moving forward, this is what our final test program uh, looked like in the treated zones. Uh, we've got zones one and three with piles spaced at five diameters, zones two and four with piles spaced at three diameters, and um, zone five is a little bit of a Franken zone. Um, you know, we knew we were going to be pushing the limits of pile driving by trying to get a two diameter spacing uh, for displacement piles, uh, but apparently we had to really learn that the hard way. Um, and so halfway through construction of a seven by seven group, we decided to change tactics and, and go to a four diameter spaced piles. Um, and that gave us some pretty good improved resolution across the, uh, at least as the effect of area replacement ratio. Um, what differentiates zones one and three, uh, excuse me, zones one and two from zones three and five is that zones one and two were fitted with prefabricated vertical drains um, prior to driving. The goal of these drains was not to drain excess pore pressure during shaking. Uh, these kinds of wick drains don't have the discharge capacity to handle uh, in, in ground uh, pore, excess pore pressures due to strong ground motion. But rather, we, want, we knew that any contractive soil would generate positive pore pressures during driving, and the goal was to remove driving-induced excess pore pressures in the siltier sand portions to see if that would aid the, the densification of silty soils. Uh, typically, if the fines content, um, the uh, non-plastic fines content is 15% or more, you're going to have a real hard time densifying without providing some kind of drainage. And so we wanted to uh, see if we could eliminate a, uh, another construction rig uh, that would install drains by uh, just attaching the drains to the piles themselves. Um, so let's go to a summary of the results of this test program. Uh, on the left-hand side, you're going to see a chart with average area replacement ratio versus the long-term change in CPT cone tip resistance. Um, the, let me tell you a little bit about the average area replacement ratio. Uh, timber piles are tapered, and so the area replacement ratio you have at the top of the pile is quite different from the bottom of the pile. Uh, for the sake of comparison, we averaged the area replacement ratio within the liquefiable layer. Uh, so there's two kind of uh, 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 cautiously fitted trend lines here. Uh, one is for drained piles. Those are the piles with the wick drains. Um, and then there's the conventional piles. And again, this is eight months after densification. Um, essentially, we don't see an effect of the wick drains at the five diameter spacing or area placement ratio of about 2%. And, uh, but when we go to uh, the three diameter spacing, we begin to see a dramatic difference. And what I, what I speculate there is that um, the piles need to be close enough to one another so that the gradients can actually push excess pore pressures to the drain uh, in a sufficiently uh, fast enough 
uh, manner. If the piles are spaced clo uh, far apart, you, you just might not be able to uh, perform significant uh, uh, dissipation of the driving-induced pore pressure. So my guess is that the efficacy of these drain piles will vary um, as a function of this um, pile spacing. On the other hand, the conventional piles um, uh, will produce uh, densification in excess of 100% if you go to a really close spacing, uh, but if you even add uh, nominally three, um, three diameter spacing, you can achieve up to, uh, according to the trend, about 80% uh, uh, in increase in long-term change in, in cone tip resistance. Um, since this data was collected in the research project, we collected new data uh, for this case history I'll talk about shortly, and it follows the short-term trend that was established during the, um, the research uh, uh, trials. Um, naturally, over time, I expect uh, the lateral stresses to relax somewhat, and that's going to reduce the cone tip resistance um, uh, back towards the long-term trend. And so that's going to be a consideration of when you perform post-densification verification testing, uh, you're going to want to consider uh, the potential relaxation uh, of those lateral stresses. So we need to think about that quite a bit. There's really two mechanisms that here that affect the cone tip resistance. One is the increase in the relative density. That obviously doesn't change with time. Uh, the other uh, factor that influences the cone tip resistance is the lateral stresses. Um, and so uh, interpreting how uh, the, the cyclic resistance is going to increase um, might be a point of discussion during the densification program. But that's no different from any other uh, ground improvement application. Uh, we were able to then go uh, after eight months and perform a controlled blasting program. Uh, for the sake of time, I can't get into much of the specifics, uh, but here is a plot of uh, percent excess pore pressure versus time for the control zone. What you see is after about three seconds of blasting, we have initial liquefaction with an increase in pore pressure for each blast. Um, if we think about the stress path that's at work here, what we're doing is we're um, uh, slowly moving down the mean effective stress axis until we hit the phase transformation line and, and quickly liquefy. Um, if we look at a representative pore pressure response in uh, zone three, for example, which was at five pile spacings, initially we have a, a, a contractive response, uh, but then something curious happens at about three or 3.8 seconds or so, and what's happening here is that we have negative pore pressures with each additional blast. And so this means we've crossed the phase transformation line and we produce a dilative response. And if we think about the mechanism that's happening here is, is that we're mobilizing the strength after a certain amount of cyclic shearing. Um, in regards to the deformations following the blasting, uh, the timber pile uh, treated zone settled about one-third to one-sixth of what we measured in the control zone. So we had about eight inches of deformation for each blast in the control zone, and uh, you know, so we got on average about uh, 25 to 50 millimeters of that uh, deformation. Any pile that was bearing into the bearing layer uh, settled about, on average, about 20 millimeters, and that's just axial compression due to down drag. Any pile that was above the bearing layer, it settled as much as the ground uh, next to it. And so everything we know about down drag was observed um, in this blast program. Okay, so let's talk about the application to a, of the driven timber pile for liquefaction mitigation at a hotel. Uh, this hotel was in Mount Pleasant, very close to Charleston, South Carolina, um, and they uh, had a proposed footprint of about 27,000 square feet. That's uh, a four-story hotel. The initial engineering recommendations were to consider either driven pre-stressed concrete piles for structural support um, or uh, mitigation of liquefaction through uh, earthquake drains uh, extending to about 10.7 uh, meters or about 35 feet, and then use shallow uh, foundations. The owner considered the uh, pre-stressed concrete piles uh, to be prohibitive, um, and so PVDs were, were initially recommended, 
Uh, and, and we note that in, in Charleston there's been good experience with uh, these earthquake drains. They do produce some densification due to the type of uh, installation method. Um, but it's been observed there in Charleston that the grade following installation can drop 6 to 18 inches. And so you've got to pay the money to reacquire the, uh, the, the grade. Uh, so that you can hit the target elevations that are necessary. Um, so that's, that can be quite expensive. Um, and with earthquake drains, you will limit lateral deformations because you're removing excess pore pressures, uh, but the result of removal of, of pore fluid is settlement. And um, it was expected that up to 10 inches of settlement could be uh, occurring uh, following the earthquake. Um, so um, a value engineering approach was taken by a contractor in South Carolina, um, and they proposed floating the, uh, the, the structure on timber piles. Um, the design was modeled after some of the recent uh, New Zealand Christchurch trials. And what we're trying to do is build a non-liquefiable crust sufficient to, um, to limit the manifestation of ground failure and, subs and to reduce the, the differential settlements under the hotel. And so uh, the goal was to, again, meet light sa life safety requirements. Um, and as part, of the test pro as part of the value engineering bid, the contractor proposed a test program. So um, when we think about the seismic hazard for that case history, just to put this design in context, uh, we're generally looking at about a magnitude 7 earthquake. Uh, it's contributed by the Woodstock Fault, which likely produced the 1886 earth, uh, Charleston earthquake, uh, which is guessed to have a magnitude of 7 to 7.3 within some um, standard deviations there. Uh, with regard to the design hazard, the PGA was about 0.31. Um, and uh, prior to improvement, it would have been considered a site class F. So let's take a look at, um, oh, excuse me here. Let's take a look at the subsurface. It was very similar to our test program. Uh, you can see uh, about 10 meters of potentially liquefiable material um, going from clean sand to the slightly silty sand. Um, so uh, regardless of, of any test uh, ground improvement um, following installation, there was a plan to raise the grade 0.9 to 1.5 uh, meters using structural fill. So our goal was to provide a stiff and densified crust of about 6 meters achieved using the driven timber piles and the structural fill to raise grade. And you can see what that looks like there. Um, let's talk about the test program. Uh, we had two uh, uh, test sections. Uh, one spaced at about 4.9 diameters, uh, the other at 7.3 diameters. You can see the range and area replacement ratios associated uh, with the test, uh, with the two test sections. And the sequence here was to pre-drill about two feet, set the pile, and then drive the pile 0.3 or one foot below uh, the grade using a follower. Uh, and all the piles were driven with this hydraulic hammer, uh, Junten HHK5. Uh, let's take a look at the results of the test program. Uh, first, the outer piles were driven first, and then the, pi the test piles were infilled with P9 and P10. You can see uh, those piles here. Uh, generally speaking, those inner piles were con produced consistently larger driving resistance than the outer piles, whereas if you look at the larger spacing at 7.3 diameters, uh, you can see that the maximum pile, uh, the driving resistance of the inner piles was generally equal to the maximum range uh, there um, in the, uh, uh, of the outer piles. And so this just gives you a sense of what the, uh, uh, what kind of indication of densification you can get. It looks like I'm short for time here, so I'll try to wrap it up here. Uh, these plots show the amount of densification that was achieved approximately 93% in cone tip resistance at 4.9 diameters, about 50% increase at 7.3 uh, diameters. Uh, one thing to note is that if there's any aging at your site, uh, you're, you're going to basically reset the age during a densification program, and that you're not going to see a change in the shear wave velocities. 
Um, so based on this test program, they selected the 4.9 meter spacing. Uh, 2,300 piles were driven to replace approximately 483 cubic meters of uh, void volumes. Um, so uh, that was a, a significant amount of densification over the uh, footprint of the structure. Um, based on our triggering analysis, I, I, won't, I guess I'll skip that slide, uh, we showed that we were able to improve the uh, factor of safety to produce the thick, stiffened crust, and based on uh, some research in Japan, that should limit the amount of deformations. I just want to thank here in wrapping up uh, the contributors to the research program, uh, which included the TRB IDEA program as well as the uh, South Carolina chapter of the Pile Driving Contractors Association. Uh, it was a, a great collaborative project that we couldn't have done without the contributors. And my master's student, Ty Gianella, deserves a significant uh, portion of the credit for his hard work in uh, executing this research. So uh, with that, uh, Jose, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Armin, and uh, I think we have a few questions here. Let me see if we can bring them up. Uh, Great. I don't know what happened to the questions. Uh, I refreshed them and uh, they don't show up. So I believe there is no questions, Armin. <laughs> um, I. I see a question by Karen Mendes. I'm, I'm not sure if it's for my um, I, my uh, presentation or not. What is the expected design life? Um, uh, boy, I'm okay, not sure. I guess that. that's structure. Um, you know, I, I think the owner was targeting a 20 to 30 year uh, service period in the event that that um, was. Uh, directed towards my presentation. But the thing to note is that when timber is driven below the groundwater table, it's an anaerobic environment, and so the timber piles will not undergo any deterioration. Now, if the groundwater table fluctuates significantly, um, that will be a problem because there could be some potential degradation when the groundwater table is low. Um, so you'll want to consider that, but any part of the timber pile below the groundwater table, which corresponds to soils that will liquefy since they have to be saturated, uh, will not experience deterioration. So I have very little reservations about that. Um, uh, however, there you can use treated piles if there is a, uh, any concern about deterioration of the timber piles. Thank you, Armin. Um... That's the only question I see there, so uh, I think we'll uh, wrap things up here. Thank you very much to all the speakers, and thank you very much to everybody who signed up and, uh, and dialed in and listened to the presentations.